Okay, big day today. We want to wrap up the new material by wrapping up section 12.6, which has four limit theorems in it, only one of which we've talked about so far, so you know what we've got to do today. So we know one of these four limit theorems, the central limit theorem. which we've used quite a bit. And so you know when it applies. It applies to uh, sums and averages of independent, identically distributed random variables. In which case, we know that the sum and average are normally distributed almost. We know what the mean and standard deviation is. So now we want to add three more Markov's inequality. Uh, Chebyshev's inequality, and the law of large numbers. Well, so let me talk about each of these. Um, an overview, Markov's inequality just involves something about the, the random variable and its mean, where Chebyshev's inequality talks about both the mean and the standard deviation, and the law of large numbers will involve the average and the mean for independent identically distributed random variables. Well, let's start with Markov's inequality. Which says the Russian mathematician Markov applies to any non-negative random variable. That is, the range of the random variable has to consist solely of non-negative numbers. Well, a lot of the things we look at, are we know they're non-negative. The probability that x is more than some number a is, can be bounded. It's less than or equal to mu over a. Well, would hold for any positive number a. It, it's only useful if a is more than mu. After all, if a is, say, half of mu, then we're being told this probability is less than or equal to 2. Well, that's not a useful piece of information, because we know that probabilities are bounded by 1. Yeah, but if a is more than mu, this is telling us something that might be useful. And in uh, an informal version in words, it's telling us that a non-negative random variable, 
say x is unlikely because we can put a specific bound on the probability to be far above its mean. Well, that's an informal version. Uh, this is what it actually says. And so if we take uh, A, say, to be K times mu, and it says the probability that x is more than k times its mean is bounded, bounded by a over, as is bounded by mu over k times mu. The mu's cancel. The probability of being 10 times its mean would only be one tenth. And the reason that's true well, not necessarily a uh, rigorous derivation, but to give an idea of the well, uh, how could it not be true? I mean, if to the contrary. Uh, the probability of being large, that is, A or more, if that were strictly more than mu over A, that would have dragged the mean up. Um, because look at it. Follows. Let's, if we calculate the mean, e of x, well, in the discrete case, it's this weighted sum. And if the random variable were a or more a lot of the time, We'd have in this weighted sum A or more weighted with some probability, some probability more than mu over A. So something here strictly more than mu over A. And then maybe some other positive terms, but not negative terms because the random variable is non negative. Well, in this product, we'd get something larger than mu. And that's impossible. because the expected value is mu. Is the probability of being way above the mean? Yeah, I mean, if that were really big, that pulls, would have pulled the mean higher than it really is. Well, that's some idea of where this comes from. For example, let's look at the following problem. Let's suppose we don't know how the weight of chickens is distributed, but perhaps we know the mean. So We'll look at the weight w. Well, 
let's suppose its mean is one and a half kilograms. Okay. And that's, that's all we know. And what, if anything, can we say about the fraction of the chickens that weigh at least three kilograms. Well, without knowing how the weight is distributed, we can't say much, but maybe we can say a little bit. The word probability doesn't, uh, is, doesn't occur here, but of course that's what it's talking about. Uh, the fraction of uh, chickens that weigh at least three kilograms would be the probability that if, when, if you go out and you choose a chicken at random from this population, probability that a randomly chosen <coughs> weighs a lot, or in other words, this probability that this random variable, it's called W for weight, in kilograms is at least three. Markov's inequality, yeah, it says the probability that a random variable that's non-negative, and what we know about weight is the weight can't go negative. So Markov's inequality applies. This is less than or equal to the mean, 1.5 kilograms divided by three kilograms. Units cancel. Yeah, this probability is one half or less. It might be a lot less. It may be that no chickens are, would be this fat. So the answer, what can we say about this fraction? Well, it's one half or less. And that should seem reasonable. If, if more than half the chickens were really chubby, that would have pulled the average weight up above one and a half kilograms. Well, a couple of comments about Markov's inequality, it, it's widely applicable because all it assumes here is that we have a non-negative random variable. On the other hand, it doesn't give us a lot of precise information. It just says, in this case, that the fraction is one half or less. It might be a, lot, a whole lot less. But it tells us something. Now, Markov's inequality says nothing about the standard deviation. If we know the standard de deviation, we can apply Chebyshev's inequality. Another Russian name. And if One sees a variety of spellings. Uh, it's, it's In the Cyrillic alphabet, the name Chebyshev starts with the same letter, say, that the name Tchaikovsky starts with. 
and you would never spell Tchaikovsky with a starting with a ch. You would always it's always spelled starting with a t. It depends on how you transliterate it from the Cyrillic. If we have a random variable with mean mu, <coughs> and standard deviation sigma, then we have the following. That if we look at the probability that the random variable is far from its mean. Say the distance between x and its mean is some number c or more. We can put an upper bound on that probability. It's sigma squared, which is just the variance, of course, divided by c squared. See here is some positive number, um, but it's only going to be useful when uh, it's, it's larger than sigma. And well, so we add this to our list of limit theorems that we can draw upon. And Informally, in, in, in words, it's, it's saying that a, a random variable is unlikely to be far away from its mean. But it says it in a quantitative way. It gives an upper bound on the probability of being more than c units away from the mean. Is unlikely. So in terms of uh, if we put uh, take for C, K times sigma, what's the probability of being more than K standard deviations away from the mean? Well, that's a quantity we've calculated for some distributions. But this applies just to any old random variable says nothing about how, what its distribution is. And it's telling us that the probability that the distance between x and its mean it is at least k standard deviations, that we can put a bound on that. Uh, sigma squared over k sigma squared, the sigmas cancel. Whatever the distribution is, uh, this probability is bounded by 1 over k squared. Well, so that tells us nothing useful about the probability of being, say, one standard deviation away from the mean, because this would just be 1. But it tells us that the probability of being 10 standard deviations away from the mean is going to be really small. And the reason this is true, ah, we can apply Markov's inequality, not to x. x might be sometimes negative. But look at the random variable x minus mu 
quantity squared, which is non-negative because we because of that square. And we know what the mean of this is. The, the expected value of x minus mu squared is the variance. That was, in fact, the definition of variance. So it has mean equal to sigma squared, the variance of the random variable. So. Uh, <coughs> so Markov's in inequality says the probability that this random variable exceeds some number, say a, is bounded by uh, by the mean sigma squared uh, divided by a. In particular, take a to be c squared. So let's rewrite this. And this event. x minus mu squared exceeding uh, e greater than or equal to c squared, OK, th that's the same as, and now we take square roots on both sides. The square root function is order preserving, so this inequality is equivalent to saying that the square root of x minus mu squared, well, that's the absolute value of x minus mu is greater than or equal to the, well, absolute value of c. But we assume c was positive. Which gives us Chebyshev's inequality. Well, so it follows from, from Markov's inequality. And But whereas Markov's inequality just involves the mean, here we have an inequality in which both the mean and standard deviation come in. For example, consider the following situation in which the inequality we're going to apply depends on what information we have. Let's suppose we're given the following fact. That the mean lifespan for an amoeba, some type of amoeba, is five days. But we're not told how the lifespan is dis distributed, in at least not yet. In particular, we're not told that it's exponentially distributed, or at least not yet. Well, what can we say, if anything, about the uh, probability that some randomly chosen amoeba is still alive after 15 days. Well, 
Well, the mean is five days. A 15-day-old amoeba is getting pretty old. Yeah, but what can we say about the chances of this happening? Well, we can apply Markov's inequality. All we know is the mean, five days. And Markov's inequality does apply because the lifespan is not negative. So it says uh, the probability, use L for lifespan of being at least 15 for a randomly chosen amoeba is, is bounded. by 5 over 15, that is the mean mu divided by the number A that we've plugged in here. So what we can say that the probability is one-third or less. could be a lot less. Maybe amoebas never survive to 15 days. But now suppose we learn some, a new piece of information. That the standard deviation of the lifespan is also five days. Now what? It is now what can we say about the probability that a randomly chosen amoeba will survive to age 15 days? Well, we already know we can say the probability is one-third or less. Is there anything else we can say? Well try applying Chebyshev's inequality to this case. And see if we get any additional information. Ah, oh. but Chebyshev's inequality talks about not uh, the probability of being far away from the mean. There's a probability that the random variable minus its mean is more than some quantity c. We can put a bound on that. If C is in days, it's the variance sigma squared, 25 days squared, divided by, by C squared. Well, fortunately, take C to be 10 here. To say that L differs from 5 by, by 10 or more means what? Uh, well, imagine the number line here. There's 5. The things that are 10 or more away from this are the things that are above 15. Or the things that are below minus 5. Okay, 
now let me write that down. Uh, uh, to be more than 10 units away from the mean 5, well, it's saying that either it uh, is way down here, or it's way up here. Yeah, but the lifespan can't be negative. So we're just looking at the event of survival to age 15. Well, the, which is what the problem is, is asking about. Uh, what's the probability of surviving to age 15? So back to the problem. Chebyshev's inequality where C is 10 days. This probability is bounded 25 over 100, a quarter. And that's the same as the event surviving to age 15. So the answer, what can we say about the probability that the amoeba is still alive after 15 days? That probability is one quarter or less. Well, before, in part A, we said the probability is one third or less. Well, th these statements are both correct, but he over here, we had more information, and so we got a sharper bound. Let's keep going. Part C, even more information. What if we're told that L is exponentially distributed? Well, then we can do a lot better. I mean, not only can we find an upper bound, we can say what the probability is. Suppose we're given this new information. L is exponentially distributed. Now what? That is, now what can we say about the probability that a randomly chosen amoeba survives to age 15? We can say what that probability is. It's e to the minus lambda t, where lambda is one-fifth and, and t is 15 days. one-fifth per day times 15 days, e to the minus 3, very nearly 1 over 20. That is what we can say now is that the probability is 1 20th. We're not saying 1 20th or less or 1 20th or more. We're saying it is 1 20th, approximately. The point is, yeah, the, the more information we have, the more we can say about the probability that this amoeba makes it to age 15. Of course, 1 20th is less than a, a third and less than a quarter. Ah, well, last on our list, what about the law of large numbers? 
this is a more conceptual fact than a computational one. And it applies in a slightly different situation. In words, it's saying something like the average of a lot of measurements again is unlikely. Well, let's look at it instead of Instead of phrasing it negatively, let's look at the positive thing. Should be close to the mean of the quantity we're measuring. Well, that's kind of vague. What exactly I want is the following. So we make a lot of measurements. That is, we take some random sample and measure height or something. We have these independent, identically distributed random variables, a bunch of them, say n of them, independent and identically distributed. So they each have the same mean, the same standard deviation. mean mu, standard deviation sigma. And we average them up. As usual, we'll call the average x bar. And we know a lot about the x bar. Um, it has mean, well, this is not so colored here. Uh, we know the mean of x bar, it's going to be mu. We know it's standard deviation. Standard deviation of x bar, sigma over the square root of n. And the central limit theorem tells us even more about x bar. What the law of large numbers says. So the probability that this is far away from mu should be small. Well, it says the following. The law of large numbers. For any positive number epsilon, so that some error term that uh, we want to look at, the probability that x bar minus mu exceeds the allowed error, epsilon, we want to say this is small. Well, it doesn't give us a, the law of large numbers doesn't give us a computational formula. It says this quantity converges to 0 as n goes to infinity. That is, this probability is going to be really small if n is big enough. Or if you, we want to look at the complement of the event, the 
probability that x bar minus mu is less than epsilon, that's going to converge to 1. It's not quite saying that x bar is converging to mu, but it's saying something very close to it. Uh, um, with probability very, very close to 1. x bar is going to be really close to mu. And two ways to look at the law of large numbers to, to see one thing, where it comes from. Well, we can either use the central limit theorem, because after all, we're talking about the average of independent, identically distributed random variables, or we could use Chebyshev's inequality. Well, let's try to do both. After all, we're talking about the probability that a certain random variable differs from its mean by some amount. And Chebyshev's inequality applies to that situation. So here our random variable is x bar, which has mean mu. Right? The expected value of x bar is mu. The probability that that's more than some number c, well, instead of c, let's call it epsilon, because that's what we're calling it. So we can put a bound on that. And that bound is, well, the denominator is c squared, or now epsilon squared. And the numerator is the variance of the random variable. Well, the variance of x bar is uh, Is, is sigma squared over n. That is, this inequality is bounded by sigma squared over epsilon squared times 1 over n. And now we let n go off to infinity. Well, sigma is fixed, epsilon is fixed. Those aren't changing. But 1 over n goes to 0 as n goes off to infinity. So that is, the law of large numbers yeah, falls out from applying Chebyshev's inequality. But since we're averaging up these independent, identically distributed variables, we could look at it from the point of view of the normal distribution. X bar has the normal distribution. Well, almost. As n becomes large, it becomes more and more closely adherent to the normal distribution, and we're letting n go off to infinity. Fine. And uh, we're interested in the probability that x bar minus mu in magnitude is greater than epsilon. We could try calculating this with the normal distribution. In the usual, okay. 
So the first thing we need to do is to standardize the random variable. We've already subtracted, subtracted its mean here. And now we could divide by its standard deviation. Well, the standard deviation of x bar is sigma over the square root of n. OK, so we have this equivalent inequality here. This is the probability that something, now call it z as usual, something with a standard normal distribution. is in magnitude at least as big as this number. Well, this is a compound fraction. Let's, let's make it look better. Uh, epsilon times the square root of n over sigma. Well, picture. Z has the standard normal distribution. And this number here, whatever it is, epsilon square root of n over sigma. Put this into the picture. The probability that z in magnitude is more than this number is represented by the, these two areas. That area for the probability that z is more than the number, and this area for the probability that z is less than the negative of that number. So we're looking at the area of these two tails. Now, as n goes off to infinity, The square root of n gets larger and larger, and this number yeah, moves further away from the origin. Epsilon and sigma are fixed here. And n is going off to infinity, so the square root of n is going off to infinity. This probability is going to go to 0, as the law of large number says. Well, wait. here we have two reasons why the law of large numbers is true. We can get it out of Chebyshev's inequality. We can get it out of the law of large numbers. We get it out of the central limit theorem. Since we already knew the central limit theorem, in a way, we sort of already knew the law of large numbers. Uh, this probability has got to go to zero. These two things are connected. Here are our, okay, well, okay. Yeah, our, the z value that we're using is, yeah, it comes up in both places. Uh, maybe we better stop here for today and we'll try to wrap things up further on Wednesday. <laughs>